on World News Tonight. Crash Conspiracy Wagner mercenary boss Yevgeny Prigozhin presumed dead after plane crash near Moscow. Square off. Republican presidential candidates gather for the first primary debate for the 2024 election cycle. Flash floods. Severe flooding forces several hundred Pakistanis to flee their homes. Chisi Gala. CMG Chisi Gala amazes audiences with traditional Chinese culture elements. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News. We begin in Russia as fresh conspiracy theories loom. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Russian private military group Wagner, is believed to be dead after reports he was aboard a plane that crashed near Moscow. The exact cause of the crash is still unknown. Russian authorities say mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin was listed as a passenger in a fatal plane crash about two months after the mutiny he led that brought the country into a crisis. This unverified video from a Russian news outlet is said to show the moment of the crash. Reuters used satellite and street view images to confirm the clip's location, but could not immediately confirm that Prigozhin was physically on board the aircraft. According to Russian authorities, the crash happened Wednesday evening north of Moscow, leaving no survivors. Ten people were on board the plane heading from Moscow to St. Petersburg, three of them crew members. State media is reporting that eight bodies were initially found at the crash site, with search and rescue operations underway. Data from online tracker FlightRadar24.com shows a plane heading northwest and then shortly after 6 p.m., suddenly disappearing. Prigozhin soared in prominence after Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year. The 62-year-old's fighters led the assault on the city of Bakhmut in the longest and bloodiest battle of the war. In June, he spearheaded a mutiny against Russia's top army brass. President Vladimir Putin said that move could have tipped the country into civil war. He was supposed to move to neighboring Belarus under an apparent deal to end the mutiny. U.S. President Joe Biden said he wasn't surprised to hear the news. There's not much that happens in Russia that not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. There was no immediate comment from Russia's defense ministry or the Kremlin. Road to the White House, we recap the much anticipated Republican primary debate where intense exchanges flew back and forth. Mike Pence and Chris Christie knocked Vivek Ramaswamy as a know it all novens, while Nikki Haley leaned into being the only woman on stage. And no matter whether former President Donald Trump is convicted of a crime, he still has the support of most of his rivals. The first Republican presidential debate of the 2024 election did not lack fireworks, even with the absence of its frontrunner Trump. Here's a look at the must-see moments of the two-hour showdown. Welcome to the first debate of the 2024 presidential campaign, live at Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee. This decline is not inevitable, it's a choice. We need to send Joe Biden back to his basement and reverse American decline. Joe Biden has weakened this country at home and abroad. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. We don't need to bring in a rookie. We don't need to bring in people without experience. We need to bring Let us be honest as Republicans. I'm the only person on the stage who isn't bought and paid for, so I can say this. The climate change oh, agenda whoa, 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 whoa. is a That's hoax. Ridiculous. The climate is change ridiculous. agenda is a hoax. Is and we have to declare independence for it. I've had enough already tonight of a guy who sounds like ChatGPT standing up here. And the last person in one of these debates, Brett, who stood in the middle of the stage and said, what's a skinny guy with an odd last name doing up here was Barack Obama, and I'm afraid we're dealing with the same type of amateur standing on stage tonight. I am unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, 
but because my husband was adopted and I had trouble having both of my children, so I'm surrounded by blessings. When it comes to a federal ban, let's be honest with the American people and say it will take 60 Senate votes. It will take a majority of the House. So in order to do that, let's find consensus. To be honest with you, Nikki, you're my friend, but uh, consensus is the opposite of leadership. When the Supreme Court returned this question to the American people, they didn't just send it to the states only. It's not a states only issue, it's a moral issue. Don't make women feel like they have to decide on this issue when you know we don't have 60 Senate votes in the House. 70 percent of the American people support legislation but to 70 ban abortion of the after Senate a baby is capable not. of experiencing okay. pain. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Whether or not you believe that the criminal charges are right or wrong, the conduct is beneath the office of President of the United States. I chose the Constitution, and I always will. I had no Mr. right President to Pence. overturn the election, and Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. Thank you, Vice President. Donald Trump is not just skipping the first Republican primary debate in Milwaukee, he is actively counter-programming it. The former president sat down for a pre-recorded interview with the host Tucker Carlson, which streamed on X during the first hour of the two-hour Republican debate. Notably, the interview garnered 126 million views within a span of six hours and continues to rise even as we speak. Why are you at the Fox News debate tonight in Milwaukee? Well, you know, a lot of people have been asking me that, and many people said you shouldn't do them, but you see the polls have come out, and I'm leading by 50 and 60 points, and, you know, some of them are at one and zero and uh, two, and I'm saying, do I sit there for an hour or two hours, whatever it's going to be, and uh, get harassed by people that shouldn't even be running for president? Should I be doing that? Uh, and a network that isn't particularly friendly to me, frankly. You know, they, uh, they were back in Ronda Sanctimonious like crazy, and now they've given up on him. I mean, he's, it's a lost cause. It reminded me very much of 2016. You know, in 2016, I went through the same stuff and had to fight them all the way, and then they became very friendly after I won, or just about when I was winning. But I just felt it would be uh, more appropriate not to do the debate. I don't think it's uh, right to do it. Uh, if you're leading by 50, 60, I have one poll, I'm leading by 70 points, and I'm saying, why am I doing it? And I'm going to have eight people, 10 people, whoever made the debate, I don't know how many it is, but I'm going to have all these people screaming at me, shouting questions at me, all of which I love answering, I love doing, but it doesn't make sense to do them. So uh, I've taken a pass. Over in Pakistan, extreme weather conditions permeated the Punjab province. Families wandered through water and cattle were loaded onto boats in a mass evacuation of around 100,000 people. Several hundred villages and thousands of acres of land in the province were inundated. When the Sabral River burst its bank, rescue boats have travelled from village to village over the past several days, collecting people who were forced to wait on the roofs of their houses as the water levels rose around them. Others pushed motorcycles through shallow waters or held belongings above their heads until they found dry ground. Mohammed Aslam, Pakistan's chief meteorologist covering floods, said the river level was at its highest in 35 years. Moreover, Mohan Singh Kawi, the caretaker chief minister of Punjab, said monsoon rains prompted Indian authorities to release excess reservoir water into the subject, causing flooding downstream on the Pakistani side of the border. India has experienced severe monsoon rains this year, with more than 150 killed in rain-related incidents since July. Eurozone consumer confidence unexpectedly decreased in August, suggesting a worsening economic backdrop in adding to the continued pressure of higher prices. The European Union's confidence indicator stood at minus 16.0 for the Eurozone in August, dropping from minus 15.1 in July and defying economists' expectations of an improved reading. The downturn in Eurozone business activity deepened far more than thought this month. That's according to key data released Wednesday. 
The bloc's dominant services industry activity fell into decline while the contraction in manufacturing output continued. The closely watched Flash Composite Purchasing Managers Index for the Eurozone fell to 47 in August. That was down from July's 48.6 and its lowest in almost three years. The number was below the 50 level which separates growth from contraction. The services PMI sank to 48.3, its first time below the 50 mark this year and worse than analyst estimates. It all comes with consumers cutting spending due to rising borrowing costs. Official data showed Eurozone inflation was 5.3% in July, more than double the ECB's 2% target, but well below readings seen late last year. The pain was sharply felt in Europe's largest economy, Germany. Business activity there contracted at its fastest in three years to 44.7 from July's 48.5. But there were some signs of a turnaround in the block. The latest PMI survey showed the worst may have passed for manufacturing activity. It's been in decline since last year, but the headline index rose to 43.7 this month from 42.7. That was its first uptick in seven months and beat analyst forecasts. We'll be back with more world news after a short commercial break. Welcome back. A deal to expand the BRICS group of developing nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, appeared stuck in 11th hour negotiations at a leaders' summit. A deal to expand BRICS appeared stuck in 11th hour negotiations on Wednesday. South Africa earlier had said the group of developing countries had agreed to a mechanism for new members, paving the way for dozens of nations to sign up. But a BRICS member country official told the leaders had not yet signed a finalized admission framework. If an agreement is reached, it could help lend clout to the group, which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, as it seeks to create a viable counterweight to the West. More than 40 countries have expressed interest in joining BRICS, say South African officials. 22 have formally asked to be admitted. They represent a disparate pool of potential candidates from Iran to Argentina. Enlarging the group was top of the agenda at a summit of BRICS leaders in South Africa. Earlier in the day, Chinese President Xi Jinping called for an accelerated process. We need to use the BRICS plus cooperation well and accelerate the expansion process. Let more countries join the BRICS family, pool wisdom and gather strength to make global governance more fair and reasonable. While all BRICS members had publicly expressed support for growing the bloc, there had been divisions among the leaders about how much and how quickly. The group's members have economies that are vastly different in scale and governments that seem to have few foreign policy goals in common. More details on the framework would be given before the summit concludes on Thursday, South Africa said. Over in North Korea, the second attempt to launch a spy satellite into orbit failed due to a malfunction in the third stage of the rocket. The unsuccessful launch came after North Korea's first attempt failed in May, when the new satellite crashed into the sea soon after liftoff. Pyongyang is set to try another launch in October. Japan's Okinawa woke to a loud siren early Thursday morning just before 4 a.m. local time, warning them to take cover indoors from a rocket North Korea had launched minutes ago. But that launch ended up as the second failure by Pyongyang to put a military spy satellite in space. North Korea said the rocket booster experienced a problem during its third stage before it could reach orbit. South Korea's military said it tracked the flight from its launch at the North's Sohei satellite launching ground and also concluded it was a failure. Thursday was the North's second failure in three months. Its Cholima-1 rocket launch on May 31st met with a similar fate, with the booster and payload plunging into the sea off South Korea's west coast. However, the North's space agency vowed on Thursday to try to launch the satellite again in October. The nuclear-armed country wants to place what would be its first military intelligence satellite into orbit, saying it eventually plans for a fleet of satellites to monitor moves by U.S. and South Korean troops. Thursday's failure comes less than a week after U.S. President Joe Biden met the leaders of South Korea and Japan at Camp David, the presidential retreat, 
where they agreed to look into conducting joint military exercises to tackle challenges that include North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. And on Monday, the U.S. and South Korea kicked off a 10-day joint military drill known as Uchi Freedom Shield, which the North called a rehearsal for nuclear war. South Korea's foreign minister Park Jin and his U.S. and Japan counterparts on Thursday strongly condemned North Korea's rocket launch, which they said was a ballistic missile designed as a space rocket. The South's foreign ministry said that the ministers agreed during a phone call to consider unilateral sanctions in response to Thursday's launch. Washington and Seoul have called Pyongyang's satellite launch a violation of United Nations Security Council resolutions that ban North Korea from testing any technology that could be used to build ballistic missiles. The United States is urging Pyongyang to refrain from, quote, further threatening activity and called on its officials to engage in serious diplomacy. Regarding the historic summit between the leaders of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, the U.S. ambassador in Seoul said the security arrangements made at Camp David is not legally binding like NATO, but a political agreement. The U.S. ambassador to South Korea, Philip Goldberg, says the commitment to consult, which outlines Seoul, Washington and Tokyo's commitment to coordinate their responses to regional threats, is not a binding agreement. While meeting reporters on Wednesday afternoon at his residence in Seoul, he stressed that Camp David is not a new NATO. He explained that it's not a duty nor a military alliance between South Korea and Japan, but rather a cooperative step where the three countries can interact when there are common threats. So you can think of it more as a, a political agreement than a legally binding agreement. When asked if the commitments made at Camp David will last even after elections, he said the interactions that will take place in the next several months will make it an enduring relationship, regardless of the political factors in each country. It has a very strong uh, commitment from the three leaders. Uh, in the case of the United States, there's a tremendous bipartisan uh, agreement, of which, uh, uh, which isn't uh, all that common. Uh, in our political uh, in our political life uh, in support of this. As for the possibility of the second trilateral summit taking place in Seoul, he said the invitation by President Yoon was well received, but refrained from confirming further details. He also highlighted President Yoon's role in bringing the three countries together by taking forward-looking policies and leadership to improve relations between Seoul and Tokyo. He added that while this relationship is very important to Washington, it depends on the people and the leaders of the two countries, and that it's not something the U.S. can and would resolve. Since taking office in May last year, President Yoon has been working to restore ties with Japan by resolving historical disputes, such as the issue of compensating the Korean victims of wartime forced labor during Japan's colonial rule, before and during World War II. Meanwhile, as for the issue of Japan's plan to release wastewater from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear power plant, the ambassador said the U.S. and South Korea's positions align, adding that Japan has followed the internationally accepted process. Crisis deepens in Argentina. Now, recent looting has left shop owners in Argentina hesitant to open their businesses in the country deep in an inflation crisis. More than 100 people have been detained. CCTV video obtained showed the moment suspects in Argentina ran away from a clothing store they had allegedly looted. A recent wave of reported vandalism and theft like this around Argentina has led to dozens of arrests and sparked fear among shopkeepers hesitant to open their businesses. The cause is unclear, but there are signs of increasing volatility from the country's inflation shooting up over 100 percent, stoking a cost-of-living crisis, as well as a tense race to general elections in October. The owner of this mobile phone store in the capital, Buenos Aires, said he was afraid to open, but he had little choice. The looters get off the bus out of the blue. You don't even expect them and get in and take you by surprise. You don't have time for anything. One takes the precautions he considers are more suited for himself. There are people who say it's better to shut down until the storm passes. But if the looting started now, at the end of August, without even getting to December, I don't want to even imagine what will happen in December. The thing is that if I don't open the store, I don't eat. 
Authorities said more than 100 people have been detained in different parts of Argentina. Police officers were mobilized to guard shops. Security Minister Anibal Fernandez alleged on Wednesday that the looting was coordinated, saying that these events were not spontaneous and not a coincidence. While Argentine President Alberto Fernandez called on the public not to resort to violence. Argentina is grappling with annual inflation that now sits at 113 percent, and J.P. Morgan estimates it could hit an eye-watering 190 percent by the end of the year. A recent sharp devaluation of its currency has made things more expensive, and it's all ratcheting up an already ugly three-way race for the presidency, currently led by radical libertarian Javier Millet, who has ridden a wave of voter anger over inflation and hardship. He's pledged to dollarize the economy and get rid of Argentina's central bank. The International Monetary Fund on Wednesday approved a $7.5 billion disbursement for Argentina. The country has been the IMF's largest debtor after years of economic crisis. Argentina's government hopes the new cash will help stabilize the country, with elections just around the corner. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. An Australian court sentenced a former principal of an ultra-Orthodox Jewish school in Melbourne to 15 years in prison for sexually abusing two former students. California's local sheriff office reported that four people, including a gunman, were killed in a shooting at a biker's bar in California's Orange County. Civilians and firefighters battled wildfires in Evra, some 30 kilometers northwest from the capital of Greek region, Evros. Hundreds of people have been evacuated across the country since fires erupted, exacerbated by strong winds in this season's second major outbreak. Drone images showed an apartment building in Chile that was left on the edge of a landslide after heavy rains in the central region of the country overnight. 25 people residing in the building were evacuated, with authorities reporting no fatalities or injuries. A rare fire whirl at Gun Lake in British Columbia was caught on camera. Fire worlds are created from a combination of high-intensity fires, high humidity and air mass instead. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in China, where the Shizhi Festival Gala put traditional Chinese culture to the fore with an array of dazzling folk opera performances. Thank you for watching. Good night.